Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it It would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius Podcast for four and a half years now which has led to 2,700-plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000-plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar, and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click support us today. Now back to the show. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, now part of the Finding Genius Foundation. I have uh, Peter Hoare. He's a professor of chemistry at University of Oxford. Um, he's studying in a very unusual uh, thing, uh, the navigational abilities of night migratory songbirds using what's called magneto reception. So we're going to talk about that and the uh, amazing implications of how they do it. So, Peter, thanks for coming. That's it. Yeah, if you would, tell me a bit about your background and how you ended up studying this subject. Okay, well, I'm a physical chemist, and I've been studying short-lived chemical intermediates known as radical pairs for most of my adult life. And I've been using the very peculiar properties of radical pairs for a number of years to do different things, uh, like studying the initial steps of photosynthesis, the process by which plants convert solar energy into chemical energy. And over the last 15 years, I've been studying radical pairs in the context of magnetoreception. So the, the hmm. possibility that this might be the mechanism by which birds detect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field as a magnetic compass. This came originally in 1978, but no one got very interested in it at that point until the year 2000, when a paper was published by Klaus Schulten in Illinois, who suggested that this might be the mechanism that the birds use. And um, because I had worked on radical pairs before that, it was an obvious thing to get interested in. And it started in a small way yes. and has now more or less taken over my research efforts. So it's about all I do at the moment is trying to solve this problem. It would be funny if you owned a dating service called Radical Pairs, but instead it's chemistry. Yeah, so. I, I do have a question for you about photosynthesis because I've only heard that the process is hundreds of steps and no one understands it fully, etc. Would you be able to give a few comments on what you discovered using your radical pair analysis of photosynthesis. Yes, yes, indeed. So one of the first things that happens after a leaf absorbs light is a series of electron transfer reactions in a complex of proteins called the reaction center. So the, the energy of the photon gets funneled into this reaction center where it excites a pair of chlorophyll molecules. And that energy is then used to drive 
a series of electron jumps. So an electron jumps from the chlorophyll dimer onto a nearby molecule and then to a neighbor and so on. There's a series of these electron jumps. They're highly efficient so that every photon that is absorbed leads to the formation of radical pairs by removing an electron from one molecule and adding it to another. And we studied those radical pairs formed in the initial steps of solar energy conversion. And we used the properties of the radical pairs to learn more about the interactions between the radicals and the factors that controlled the efficiency of that process. And we could relate radical pair properties to the um, energies of those different states. Uh, and so we were able to understand a bit better um, why the process is so efficient. Um, and then, as you say, there are lots of other things that happen downstream of that. Just a quick question. What's the um, theoretical limit of photosynthesis as it's understood versus the actual utilization of the efficiency of it? Well, no, it depends what you mean by efficiency. So um, the, the quantum efficiency is 100% in the sense, as I mentioned, that every single photon leads to charge separation and energy stabilization. What you sacrifice to get that high efficiency is that some of the energy of the photon has to be wasted. So it's, uh, I can't remember the exact figures, but it's something like 60, 70% efficient in energy terms. Okay. Well, tell me about this uh, magnetoreception. What's the, the, this is how certain birds navigate, and uh, what are you discovering about how they do it, actually? Yes. Okay. So it's clear that many small songbirds fly enormous distances when they migrate, and it's also clear that they have a variety of sources of directional information. They can use the sun and the stars um, to navigate. Um, they also can use a sense of smell, and they can recognize landmarks, which will help them home in on their target when they get close to it. But they also have a magnetic compass. That is, they can detect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. And so the problem we're trying to solve is how that magnetic compass works. So we've known for more than 50 years now that birds like European robins do have a magnetic compass. And it looks like it might be based on radical pair chemistry. And that's what we're trying to investigate. How extraordinary is this uh, ability to sense, if you, if you were, you know, maybe an order of magnitude calculation, but, um, you know, what is the field strength of the Earth's magnetic field that a compass can pick up versus what the birds can pick up, for instance, a comparison? Yes. Well, um, of course, human compass needles can detect the direction of the Earth's magnetic field, but they are much bigger than anything, of course, you would find inside a bird's body. And they're also made of magnetized metal. So the Earth's magnetic field is not very strong. It's about 10 to 100 times smaller than close up to a small fridge magnet. And uh, the mechanism we're interested in is a chemical reaction, which we think is sensitive to the Earth's magnetic field. And molecules are not themselves very magnetic. So the interaction between the two, a molecule and the Earth's magnetic field, is pretty weak, approximately a million times smaller than you would normally think it would need to be to affect a chemical reaction. Now, that argument wow. is based on thermodynamics. So every molecule has what's known as thermal energy. So molecules are ceaselessly jigging around moving, rotating, vibrating. And normally you need to apply, if you want to affect a chemical reaction, you need to apply an amount of energy at least as big as that thermal energy. And so the interaction of a molecule with the Earth's magnetic field is a million times smaller than that. So at first sight, you would say that there's no possibility that you would ever affect a chemical reaction with the Earth's magnetic field. But that argument is wrong in the context of radical pairs, which have very peculiar properties that make them exquisitely sensitive to very weak magnetic fields. And we've been able to show, using uh, experiments on model compounds, that you can affect a radical pair reaction in a molecule uh, with a magnetic field as weak as that of the Earth. So what, um, 
I don't know if you were to create a visual model of what a bird, one of these birds that uses magnetoreception experiences as they fly, what would the field look like, you think? Yeah, it's a good question, and we really don't know. I mean, it is possible that the birds have a visual perception of the field. We know that the magnetoreceptors are in their retinas, and of course we know that the main function of the retina is vision. And we know that the proteins called cryptochromes that we think are the magnetoreceptor molecules, we know that they are in the retina of migratory songbirds um, and in certain types of photoreceptor cells. So it, it, it's possible that the birds literally see the Earth's magnetic field. Quite what they would see or in some other way perceive, we, we really don't know. You can speculate. I mean, it might be just um, a bright or a dark spot, which is superimposed on the field of vision, which is dead center in the field of vision when the animal faces along the north-south axis. Or it might be more subtle than that. I mean, we have done some calculations on what pattern might be generated by these cryptochrome proteins and the radical pairs in them. And you have to make an awful lot of assumptions to calculate those patterns, but we did those calculations nevertheless. And what we found was that under certain circumstances, there could be a rather distinctive cross-shaped pattern, which would look symmetrical and again would be central in the field of vision if the bird was looking uh, along a north-south direction. But really that's just... Well, why not, um, yeah, could you recreate some of these patterns with lasers or something else in a room and see if the birds fly in a, in a certain direction? Did yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question, but I don't think that's going to work. I think that birds will not be so easily fooled. And also the way in which the birds are studied in the lab is by testing them under very carefully controlled conditions where the only sense of direction they can get is from the magnetic field that you subject them to. Now, if we were instead to put them in a room with a pattern projected onto the walls, then they would almost certainly be attracted by the light of that pattern, and they might well orient simply because it was brighter in one direction than another. It would be very, very difficult to separate out that response from anything to a magnetic field. So far, what do you think the me mechanism is by which they can interact with the Earth's magnetic field as they fly? Okay, so we, we think that these cryptochrome proteins form radical pairs. So that the, we know that the bird's compass is light-dependent, even though many of the songbirds fly at night. And of course, there's, it's never totally dark at night. If it were, the birds wouldn't fly. They wouldn't be able to see anything. So they need light for their compass to operate. And we believe that these proteins called cryptochromes in their eyes absorb light um, in, specifically in the blue and green regions of the visible spectrum. And that a bit like the photosynthesis I was talking about earlier, that the energy of the photons trigger a series of electron transfers, in this case, within the cryptochrome protein. So an electron jumps, inside the protein three or four times between different parts of the protein. And that forms a radical pair. And we think that that is the state of the protein that is sensitive to the magnetic field. Now, we've been able to show with laboratory experiments that the cryptochrome from the European robin does seem to have the right properties. So we've purified, produced and purified the protein from this migratory bird and then studied it using a variety of spectroscopic methods and shown that weak magnetic fields do affect the lifetime of those radicals and the way in which they subsequently react. So what we think happens is that inside the bird's eye, these photochemical reactions are taking place and the res Products formed from the radical pairs form a state of the protein that has a different shape. So we call it a signaling state, and the amount of signaling state formed depends on the amount of light that produces the radical pairs, but also, crucially, on the magnetic field. And that's 
differently shaped form of the protein interacts to a greater or lesser extent with other proteins in the cell. And those protein-protein interactions trigger a cascade of biochemical reactions, which ultimately lead to nerve impulses going from the eye along the optic nerve into the brain, where they will be integrated with information from other sources like the sun or the star or compass. And then on the basis of all that information, the bird makes a decision on which way it needs to fly. So we're not sure that this is the right mechanism yet, but it's, there's more evidence for this than any other mechanism. Um, and it's looking promising at the moment. I don't know, could you be a bit more de detailed on how this actually happens? So how does the magnetic field interact? And you know, what are the quantum effects or the possible quantum effects here? Okay, so radicals are molecules that have an odd number of electrons. So most molecules have an even number of electrons and those electrons exist in pairs, one with magnetic moment pointing up and the other with the magnetic po moment pointing down. So I should say that the crucial property of the electron in this context is that it has a property known as spin or spin angular momentum to give it its full name. And associated with that spin is a magnetic moment. So if all the electrons are paired up, um, then the magnetic moments cancel and there's no interaction with the Earth's magnetic field. But if you take an electron out of one molecule and give it to another, as happens after the, the cryptochrome absorbs light, then those two molecules, the one that's lost an electron and the one that's gained an electron, then have an odd number of electrons, so they're not all paired up. And so those radicals have a net magnetic moment due to that odd electron. And those two electron spins, one in each radical, separated in the protein by about two nanometers, these can exist in so-called singlet or triplet states. So the singlet state has the two electron spins pointing in opposite directions, and the triplet state has the two electron spins pointing in the same direction. So these are extremely similar states of the protein. You've got the same radicals in both cases, it's just that the two electron spins are either parallel or anti-parallel, triplet or singlet. And because the radicals are not very close to one another, they interact very weakly with each other. And that means the singlet and the triplet states are very similar in energy. So an analogy would be two magnets, say a meter apart, um, which would be far enough that they would hardly affect one another. It's only when you bring them within a few centimeters of another, each other do they attract or repel. So we've got these two electron spins, the singlet and triplet states are very similar energies. And that means they can be interconverted relatively easily by small amounts of energy. Now, there are internal magnetic interactions within the radicals. These are coupling between the electron spin and the spins of atomic nuclei of atoms such as hydrogen and nitrogen. So protons and neutrons also have spin and therefore magnetic moments, a lot weaker than that of the electron. But those nuclear magnetic moments interact with the electron spins in each of the radicals. And that's known as a hyperfine interaction. And pretty much any radical you can think of has several of these hyperfine interactions. And those are important. And then and they cause the coherent interconversion of the singlet and triplet states. So when the radical pair is formed, it's initially in a singlet state, but it oscillates from the singlet to the triplet and back again at a variety of frequencies, which are typically a few megahertz, a few million oscillations per second. And those oscillations are driven by the hyperfine interactions, and they're fundamentally quantum mechanical. Now, those oscillations between singlet and triplet can be affected by the Earth's magnetic field. So that at any instant, the probability that the radical pair is singlet or triplet depends not only on these hyperfine interactions, but also on the interactions of the electron spins with the Earth's magnetic field. And those interactions depend not just on the presence, but also the strength, and crucially for a compass, on the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. So you can affect this quantum spin dynamics of the radical pair by a very weak magnetic field. And therefore, you can affect the 
probability that that radical pair will go on to form the signaling state. And so that's basically the mechanism. Mm. Okay. How much of a change in the frequency will there be? Will, will there be based on this? Okay, that's a good question. I mean, the Earth's too. magnetic field. How much does it affect it? And you know, yeah. against, so against the background of a million cycles a second, let's say, I mean, how different is it? Okay, so the the oscillations that are induced by the Earth's magnetic field at one point four megahertz, so one point four million times per second, and the effect of that weak field depends on the conditions. So under the conditions of the experiments we do on the purified proteins in the lab, if we were to use an earth strength magnetic field, then we wouldn't see any effect. It would just be swamped by the instrumental noise of the measurement. So the experiments that we've done to investigate this Robin cryptochrome in the lab have been done with fields 10 or 20 times stronger than the Earth's magnetic field. And then we see effects of the order of 10% change in the yield of a signaling state. Now, exactly what happens inside cells in the bird's eyes, we don't know. It's much more difficult to do experiments under those conditions. But we can anticipate that the different conditions inside the cell may allow a similar effect, perhaps up to 10%, even in the Earth's magnetic field. That's one of the many things about this mechanism that we don't know how big the fundamental effect actually is. But if it is the right mechanism, then it seems reasonable to believe that it will have been optimized by evolution over countless generations of migratory birds um, to be sufficiently sensitive as a magnetic compass. So for, in the first case, how do birds, I don't know, register this? Is a single to triplet conversion signal if it's oscillating in the megahertz range. Okay, so their biology even, I don't know, read what's going on at such a fast pace. Yeah, so that they don't measure the oscillations. Um, what they measure is or respond to, would be a better description, they respond to the change in the yield of the signaling state. So this form of the protein that has a different shape. So as they would move their head around from side to side in the Earth's magnetic field, that would cause the cryptochromes in their eyes to have different orientations relative to that magnetic field. And that would change the amount of the signaling state inside the cells in their eyes. And when the head was pointing in a direction that had a large amount of signaling state, then they would get... Uh, more nerve impulses going to the brain. And then if they move their head in another direction, um, the the density of nerve impulses would drop. So they're they're responding to, in effect, an average uh, over these megahertz oscillations. So do you think this is a visual cue? It seems like it is a cross-hatch pattern, or is it a physical cue, a feeling of thickness or density change as they fly through the magnetic field in a certain direction? We don't know how they perceive it. Um, As I say, it could be a visual perception, bright or dark spot, perhaps, that moves around. So think about a heads-up display for the pilot of a fighter jet or something like that, that uh, you would have present all the time in your field of vision some thing that would indicate the direction of the Earth's magnetic field. That's probably oversimplifying things. We really don't know what the perception is. But this is not a, a gross navigation. I mean, from what I've heard, various birds will migrate to the exact same tree thousands yes. of miles away. So there must be some very high fidelity. Or maybe it starts out directionally, but once they get close, there's got to be some really detailed, very fine, well, again, very fine details for them to navigate. Yeah, yeah. You're, quite, you're, you're quite right. So the, the, the magnetic compass will be useful over large distances. So think about a robin flying from Scandinavia to Africa. The first couple of thousand miles, the magnetic compass will be really useful. It doesn't have to be very precise. Um, It needs to get the bird going in approximately the right direction, helped also by the sun compass and the star compass. Um, What the magnetic compass will not be so good at will be um, homing in on the destination. So the the first time the young birds fly, 
they have an, a genetic inherited recipe for where they need to fly. And it'll be something like fly for two weeks at the southwest direction and then for one week in the southeast direction. And if you do that, you'll end up on the coast of North Africa. And so the first time the birds fly, um, they don't know precisely where they're going and they will just stop when they get to somewhere that seems to have the right climate and food supply. Having done that once, then they will have built up in their brains a magnetic map. So they have a, an innate compass that they're built with that allows them to do the first journey. And the experience they gain en route will allow them to build up a map in their brain. So that then will allow them to come back to exactly the same place they were hatched in Scandinavia. And then the next year, when they fly to Africa again, they'll be able to use their sense of smell and landmarks to find the very same tree that they were at the previous year. So it's a mixture of uh, genetic information they're born with and um, a magnetic map, which they learn by experience. And what do you think the birds see? Yeah, what, what do you think the birds see when they look? directly ahead in the air versus let's say look down at the ground do you think the patterning changes or oh, yeah. solid objects versus air literally have a i don't know visually do they have a different look under a magneto reception would you guess well i mean there has to be something that will move around as the bird moves its head from side to side up and down what however it perceives the magnetic field something or other must move around and it will be programmed during that first flight to know that it needs this object that it perceives to be, let's say, dead center in its field of vision for the first two weeks, and then maybe off to the right-hand side for the next week. That must be the kind of program that it uses. Of course, if it gets too close to other sources of magnetic field, then that pattern could be distorted, and that might be bad news for the bird's navigation. So one of the things we find, found, uh, this is in collaboration with my colleague at the University of Oldenburg in Germany, Henrik Mauritsen, that the birds can be disoriented by very weak time-dependent magnetic fields. Uh, so mag magnetic fields with frequencies that are similar to those of the singlet triplet into conversion. So a few million times per second. And what we don't know yet is exactly how that happens. It is clear that certain radio frequency electromagnetic fields, very weak electromagnetic fields, will prevent the birds using their magnetic compass when we test them under carefully controlled conditions. And so presumably this additional magnetic field is interfering with the sensor. And we can understand that in the context of radical pairs because if you match the frequency of this additional field to one of the frequencies of the singlet triplet into conversion, then that could distort the information that the bird is getting from the Earth's magnetic field. Now, what we don't know is whether the birds are subject to the same effects in free flight. So these radio frequency fields I've been talking about are generated by all kinds of electrical equipment, and they're very, very weak. And almost certainly for most animals, including humans, they have no consequences whatsoever. But the birds have an extraordinarily sensitive magnetic sensor, which might by accident also be extraordinarily sensitive to very weak time-dependent fields, which normally carry no directional information at all, so are useless for navigation. Uh, what we do know is that the birds fly um, quite high, typically above the cloud level so that they always have the sun, uh, or at least the stars at night to navigate by. And that may be high enough to be above the level at which these man-made radio frequency fields could be a problem. And also the birds so they're, probably may... using, they're probably using visual cues of all sorts, and then the magnetic field is just maybe like an overall guiding sense of yeah, whatever I mean, the field is stronger or weaker. Yeah, they will, the birds will use any information they can get that is reliable. 
And so it's, it's always going to be a mixture of different cues. Magnetic. I mean, solar. you think it's, um, it's, just as, it, it's just as good as a compass for people. It's directional, but not much more. And all the other cues, you have to rely on visual ones and otherwise. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I mean if, if you think about, you know, if you were out hiking and you were in a thick fog so that you couldn't see where you were going, then you would rely on whatever other information you had. So, I mean, that could be a magnetic compass if you had one. Maybe you could use your sense of smell to help you find the right direction. You would use whatever information you, you had, and it must be the same for the birds. Any source of directional information will surely have been optimized by evolution to give the birds an advantage, to make it more likely that they survive these uh, long journeys every year. So, you know, again, like if we liken it to the game of golf, does the magneto reception essentially tell them, all right, the, the hole is that way. But once, let's say, they get on the putting green, you know, then, then visual cues take over. Yeah. Like, you know, once a bird gets near where it normally would nest. Yeah, yeah that's, that's right. Good. I mean, if they've, if they've been to that place before, then they'll be able to use sense of smell and landmarks and vision and find the same branch or the same tree or the same burrow. So the second time they fly, they have a precision of centimeters. The first time, it may only be 100 meters uh, or uh, uh, 10 kilometers, something like that, just to get them in the right kind of region. And that, as I say, because they haven't yet got the magnetic map. Yeah. If, um, if I was able to see as they see, and I looked at a tree, would the tree look any different to me than just with my visual, visual ability with um, you know, an overlay of the magnetic reception? Or is, it, is the magnetic reception so weak? that a tree would appear as no difference, let's say front to back or branch to branch under the, the quote unquote light of magnetic reception. No, the, I mean, the tree would look the same. I mean, it would, so that the birds, humans, as you know, we have three different color sensors. The birds have four. They can also see into the ultraviolet. So their colors will look different. So, but that's a purely vision. The, the magnetic information will be in some way superimposed on that visual impression. And so, that, yeah, the tree may perhaps look a bit lighter or darker, depending on which direction the bird is looking. Maybe. I don't know. But do you think that magnetic reception could play a small role in the identification of that particular tree that I'm going to nest in versus another? Oh, no, I think that, I mean, I think your analogy of the golf course was quite good. Once you get onto the putting green, the technique that you used on the fairway is no longer much use to you. You use other sensors to get you to the hole, I guess. Okay. No, I figure, you know, again, magnetic reception is, is sensing a very, very weak force to begin with. I don't think there'll be enough fidelity that if I look at a given object... You know, that's sitting in the Earth's magnetic field here, like, let's say a tree, would it look different front to back, side to side, or, again, the fidelity just would be nowhere near in order to be able to, to sense that? Yeah, I don't think it would look any different. It just might have superimposed on it a pattern that would tell the bird something about which way its head was facing. And that would be nothing to do with the tree and everything to do with which way the bird is, happens to be looking at that moment. Okay. Well, very good. Peter, what do you feel like some of the, the remaining gigantic holes are in the, uh, you know, that you need to fill in with your research? What are the, the things you're looking to, to solve over the next few years? Okay. Well, we would like to prove or find out whether this really is the right mechanism. So more in more detail, one of the things we were able to show recently is that the cryptochrome from the European robin, the migratory bird, shows larger magnetic field effects in the laboratory than the corresponding proteins from a pigeon and a domestic chicken, neither of which migrate or travel such large distances. And so we would like to understand why the robin protein from the migratory bird is more sensitive to magnetic fields, because one interpretation, of course, is that it might have been optimized by evolution for the bird that needed to travel large distances. Now, the three proteins, robin, pigeon, and chicken, are very, very similar. 
and differ only in a few of the 600 or so amino acids that constitute the protein. So we would like to find out which of those amino acids are responsible for the differences. And one way we can approach that is by producing mutant proteins in which we swap one amino acid for another. And so we could make a pigeon cryptochrome more like a robin cryptochrome or vice versa, and then see if the magnetic field effects get bigger or smaller when we do that. And in that way, try and find out what's special about migratory bird cryptochromes. And at the same time, we can use the techniques of phylogenetics to trace the sequence of the cryptochromes back in evolutionary time. So it's possible to go back tens of millions of years to discover or to predict what the sequence of amino acids would be in uh, the cryptochromes from very early birds. And then we can produce those proteins in bacterial cell culture and purify them and study them in the laboratory in the same way that we've studied the robin, chicken, and pigeon proteins, and see how sensitive those ancestral cryptochromes are. And so that should tell us something about when magnetoreception evolved in early birds, and what those crucial changes in amino acid um, sequences were that allowed the cryptochromes to be used as magnetic sensors. That's one of the things we're trying to do at the moment. Okay. Well, very good. Uh, where can people find out more about your work and your work with uh, Hendrik Moritzson as well? Where can they go? Okay. Well, if you look at the April issue of Scientific American, uh, there's an article that Henrik and I wrote in that. We also have a, a more detailed uh, review article published a couple of years ago in um, Annual Review of Biophysics. And that includes a tutorial on the radical pair mechanism. Uh, our aim there in the first part of that review article was to try and to explain the, the physics and the chemistry of the radical pair mechanism to the biologists and explain the biology to the physical scientists. So that, that would, that's a bit more detailed, though, than the Scientific American. Okay. Well, very good, Peter. Thanks for coming on the podcast and uh, really fascinating work you're doing. I hope you figure it out soon. Thank you very much. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.